Cairo is my baby's home. Cairo, Cairo is my baby's home. One bad Cairo night won't be long. Carol, they will treat you kind and sweet. Women in Carol, they will treat you kind and sweet. Catch you around and take you off your feet. and knock you, peach you, cut you too. Shoot and knock you, peach you, and cut you too. They get through the graveyard then for you. got you all connected and I'm here and I'm uh, happy to announce another Blue Monday live stream. Hope you're gonna have some fun with us today because I'm not alone. Uh, we have a special guest, Bert Divert, who's gonna join me in, uh, in about 10-12 minutes maybe. And we're gonna be talking about life, blues, mandolins, career as a musician, a lifelong career, and maybe some, some other stuff. We'll see. All right, changing the setup all the time, so I need to make sure everything works properly and that you guys hear as well. Please let us know in the chat if something's wrong. Hello, Norwegian Attack, Mr. Geyer. Great to see you. Uh, this is just a little uh, reminder that I have this uh, uh, open G thing uh, because I'm going to be doing things in both open G and open D so uh, we'll see how that will all go all right it's time for the welcome song well 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 of uh, Piccolo Rag with uh, Blind Boy Fuller. Well, you gotta stop doing what you do to me, babe. Don't you gonna run me wild. Gotta stop doing what you do to me, babe. I mean just what I say. Well, I talk about love, man, and so does he. He done made me little bit, and I wanna go. Gotta stop doing what you do to me, babe. Don't you gonna run me wild. I mean, don't you gonna run me wild.
let's go to bed. You gotta stop doing what you do to me, baby. Don't you go run me wild. I mean, don't you go run me wild. Oh, dee 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 da da da. too excited today so many things to think about and so many things to to uh to do for you guys so i forgot to put on my cameras for the three of you three camera of you all right let's do it this way i will just uh, repeat a couple of these uh, uh licks so you can you can hear those that's right actually this is what i'm gonna be uh, doing here uh, is a part of this kind of preparation stuff when you when you're like trying to do stuff and you're planning to play songs and you think oh I can play this anytime no problem I played it thousands of times but you made a break and you haven't played that for a while this is exactly what happened with this song now so I'm kind of throwing myself to the lions and uh, I'll do it one more time but then in the later uh, part of the, of the stream when you have the today's theme then I'll tell you how uh, this thing actually should be done. All right, go. Gotta stop doing what you do to me, babe. Don't you wanna run me wild? Gotta stop doing what you do to me, babe. Me just what I say. Well, I talk about love and so does he. He done made a little baby and I wanna play. Gotta stop doing what you do to me, babe. Don't you wanna run me wild? I mean. was a unrehearsed version of a song that I played for I guess 25 maybe 30 years but I haven't played it for a really really long while especially not in the live stream and not in the in the performance so this is going to be one of the <laughs> today's theme when I'm going to be talking about that but now we're going to the backup to the backup for today So we're going uh, to the backups and I'm going to be in open G. So this here is the tuning you need to go to. And uh, I guess by now you've all learned how to tune to this. This is the 24th live stream. So the next week is going to be 25th. slow blues backup in open G as the guitar backup for today the first one
So that was the first backup. Now I'm gonna do the backup number two, which is gonna be a bit more lively. And it's actually uh, as if I was playing, let's say, Stagesboro Blues, uh, but without this kind of uh, talking part in the middle. So we're just gonna do the, the, the average chord changes in that kind of uh, groove. So, and the basic, of the basics of this is right, so it's kind of finger picked uh, pattern. All right, I think I'm going to. This is a small guitar, so the whole fret won't fit when I play like this. And I need a whole uh, neck, sorry. absolute favorite grooves when it comes to this kind of old-timey old-timey blues all right so let's see who we got here Nilavan all right I won't forget Bert you're listening to this and I'm gonna bring you in in a minute but uh, Milovan here is a friend of mine uh, that I have known for many years but only online but we come from the same country, old former Yugoslavia. So it's like great. We just kept contact, all, you know, over the years and everything. So uh, when he heard that you're going to be playing, and uh, visiting me today in my live stream, then he mentioned that uh, he used to watch Yank Rachel play in a club very close by where he lived. So you're more than welcome to to write more about that Milovan in the chat if you want. Hello, Jonas. Great to see you. And uh, I think, I think it's about time that we bring in Mr. Bert Divert, who I'm, I'm going to unmute in a second when I find my stupid mouse here on this computer. But uh, I'm going to be do it now. So yeah. now everything should be working. 
And with the press of a button, welcome, Bert Diver. Great to see you. Thanks very much, Mac. Great to be with you. Yeah. Um, we've known each other for quite many years now. And, uh, yeah, I don't remember how long. I think we met maybe around 2005, 2006, something like that. Yeah, yeah something like that. Maybe before. I don't know. Yeah. I think we got uh, contact through, believe it or not, letters. I think we had a, a real letter kind of exchange. Ah, okay. Well, that would have been be. That's probably when I was interested in in resonators early, early exactly. on. Yeah. Yeah. When I was dealing with right, the yeah. guitars, continentals, and all right. that. And then you just kind of yeah. send me a, you know, very nice of you to send me a cassette tape with some recordings. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Mid nineties, man. It was like, a, whoa. <laughs> that's when I had my thirty-one Duolian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, cool. you, you divide your life in the parts of, okay, this is when I had this guitar, this is when I got that guitar. Right, it's like, yeah. That's where we age, like, with our instruments, right? Yeah, <laughs> and how much hair we had, too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you, got, you got much more left than I do, but... Uh, uh, right. There's not that much more up there. It's just, like, <laughs> it's hanging in the front a little bit, really. Yeah. But, hey, but, hey yeah. we, we sure know a lot more, and we sure play better than we did when we were younger. Oh yeah, wow. that's definitely it. That's man. Good. Yeah. Hey man, uh, we we got loads of information about you because you have a great website with lots of info, lots of photographs, and all that stuff. But to be true, I prepared something that we could uh, see all of us here together. Right. And uh, I think I'll just uh, do it like this. And this is your website where people can read about you so we're not going to go through this and all that but this is a no uh, a <laughs> a, yeah, because it's a lot and we, yeah. we don't have the yeah. you know well we have a, the whole life in front of us right <laughs> yeah hopefully <laughs> yeah. 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 but uh, uh, this is where, where um, I read about you and uh, I knew about your travels and lots of stuff that, that you've been uh, doing but uh, I didn't have the complete picture about exactly who when, where, and uh, how. But uh, m my first question to you is going to be like, uh, I mean, why? Why music? Why did you start playing? How did you get inspired? And who inspired you mm -hmm. the most to take up an instrument? Because it's not only mandolin. Mandolin is your kind of uh, main instrument. You're mostly known as a top mandolin. Yeah, I'm. it's my third instrument, actually. So okay, it's so like... Good morning. I've, world. I've only been playing mandolin seriously for 16 years. Like I'm, I'm a, I started out as a drummer. Um, well, actually, I started out as a singer as a kid, sang in choirs and uh, often sang solo in the choirs. And I just dug singing. And my mom and dad had like Dinah Washington records and um, stuff like that. And I used to listen to that. And, and, and then I started playing drums when I'd seen the Beatles and my brother and I started a band and um, uh, I played drums for a while and sang at the same time, like the Beach Boys drummer, Dennis Wilson. And yeah. then um, <laughs> I decided uh, my, I'd steal my brother's guitar when he wasn't at home. And he said, you can't play it. I'm the oldest one, though. So <laughs> I watched out when he was, wasn't at home. I would sneak it in and started learning chords. And um, yeah. and I, yeah, I mean, I started doing gigs when I was 15. Um, and uh, I started playing drums when I was 13. And um, cool. yeah, I just I just felt like music. Wow, yeah, that's, I wanted to actually, um, when I was in high school, I was thinking about applying to Berklee School of Music as, as a drummer, but I just didn't have the, the chops and the music, well, mostly the music skills of reading that you had to have. You had to be able to read music. Um, and I could only read drum music. And I've never, never learned to read regular music. Oh, so uh, yeah, I brought I brought my guitar with me, and uh, I got sort of hassled by the jocks. Those are the, like the sports guys, you know, for playing my drums in my room. So I couldn't play drums anymore. So I started really playing a lot of guitar, and singing, and I got into folk music and blues. I was a DJ on the radio station when I was seventeen at uh, the 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 university. I started I started school young when I was five. So um, I had my first year at university, 17, and I saw they had a radio station. So I had this 
radio show and on AM and they had so many records that I, I was just going crazy. Like, wow, this one, this one, this one. Mm -hmm. And I was able to listen to a lot of blues that I'd only been able to hear on on the uh, sort of uh, underground radio station in Boston. I was grew up in New Hampshire most of the time. We moved a lot, but that was during my high school years. And so, yeah, I would play guitar. I went to San Francisco to do my master's degree in filmmaking was super poor so i started playing on the streets to earn money because i didn't i had a scholarship but i didn't have any <laughs> money to live on yeah. i met peter case um who's quite well known as a, and he had a band called plimsolls and another one called the nerves later on and he's he's, he's a great singer songwriter and uh he and i and another guy danny played on the streets uh and i made a, a documentary film about us <laughs> for my right. um, master's thesis some of it's used in the documentary that ju just came out uh, at the Santa Barbara Film Festival about Peter. And um, Peter in actually introduced me to Blues Mandolin. We were sleeping in a crash pad in Haight-Ashbury. This was 1973. You never knew who was going to be there. I mean, like, one night you come home and there's some guy shooting heroin in the corner, and another night you come home, like, I don't know, people are having a party. It, it was really weird. But he had this little travel gramophone and he had this, oh, Bert, listen to this, you know, what's this? I hadn't heard them before. Sleepy John Estes and Yank Rachel. And he put it on. I was like, wow, this is incredible. And so we listened and listened and listened and got stoned and, <laughs> and listened. And uh, then we started playing uh, Broken Hungry on the streets uh, and some other tunes about a really mixed up repertoire. You know, you're playing for tourists and you're trying to make money. So you got to sort of change it around a bit but yeah. I got hooked on that sound I couldn't forget it and um, I played for about a year on the streets and I met a Swedish girl and ended up moving to Sweden in 1974 and uh, that would be I my kept... next question exactly why how Sweden and why yeah okay. yeah well oh, yeah. you know many many of us <laughs> came here because of Swedish girls yeah. and uh, started families you know so then, but then when I came to Sweden, um, I'd actually, I actually had a master's degree in, in filmmaking uh, and I was qualified to teach university, but I was only 23 years old. So people didn't take me seriously at, at Arbetsförmedling, you know, or anything <laughs> like that at the, you know, they just like, what, you know? <laughs> so they said, well, you can start over at Komvux, which is like adult high school. I said, what? Yeah. I've gone 18, six years at university. Are you kidding? So I just decided to continue with the music, you know? So I did that for 20 years full time. And then all of a sudden I got a chance to do some lectures uh, in filmmaking. And I, I did that and I started like, then I had another income, which was helpful. And uh, then I decided uh, that I was gonna really learn how to play like Yank Rachel in 2004. Like I, I thought about that stuff all the time. You know, I wanted to start a blues band when I first came to Sweden and I started a band, but like, you know, in, in Karlstad, in Vermont, like nobody was yeah. listening to blues, you know. Uh, I heard about these guys and read about them and sort of tell you, you know, Sven Bay and all these guys, but I never knew them or met them. I, you know, I was a country guy playing folk music and, and blues, country blues. But how, how did you, um, um, did you play uh, uh, Swedish folk music? And, I, mean, folk I did, music, yeah. Oh, blues, yeah. Because of your wife or yeah. how, how was the whole uh, thing with that? Well, I was interested in all folk music. You know, I I I played I, I played Irish music and I played Irish music professionally with Christy O'Leary, who's one of the best pipers and singers in, uh, from Ireland. And he he now lives in Sweden, and he and I have toured in Australia and around Europe, um, playing backup dad god tuning, okay. um, and Irish bazooki. And um, okay. in fact, Mickey Sandane, that's how I met him. He was at, playing at our Irish festival that we used to promote here. Oh, in great, great. Yeah. Um, well, I, I was interested in Swedish folk music. And then um, my second wife, um, who uh, I'm st still together with after about 40 years, she's a Swedish fiddler. And um, so she and I played together and uh, she made a rec record of her own tunes a few years ago. And I'm I'm playing on it along, along with a lot of other people. Yeah. But it's hard to break into the Swedish folk music thing when you're like a foreigner, you know, it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, the same thing in Ireland, sometimes people will say, oh, I'm American. Uh, 
you know, like <laughs> wannabe Irish kind of thing. But uh, I've sort of broken through it in Ireland, but I've never been able to break through it here. <laughs> so I've just played my own music. I wrote songs, you know, I, 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 I would, would go to concerts and I met, um, I went to listen to Eric Bibb and Cindy Peters at the theater in Karlstad, probably like 1975 or something. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. went up and had a shot with him afterwards. He was so good. I mean, and I didn't understand why he wasn't the the front leader, you know. He was just backing up Cindy Peters, and she gave yeah. him a, a spot, you know. Yeah. And then we ended up being on the same um, uh, uh, record label, Opus 3. Really? So I got, and, and when I found out he was on the label too, later on in 70, what was it, 70, I made my first album here in 78. Um, and then in 79, I got in touch with him and said, hey, you want to do something together? You're on, we're on the same label and all that. It'd be really cool. And I said, yeah, well, we yeah. We got some man, proof okay. about that. So uh, here yeah. are some photos of yours. And uh, <laughs> a couple of them uh, with the great uh, mandolins that you uh, own and play and uh, sometimes mm. uh, deal with, right? Sell, buy, and all yeah, that. Yeah, sometimes you sell, yeah. 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 But uh, here's one of the greatest... There's Eric and me, and uh, that's yeah. in 1979, at uh, when we Bo Hansen, our, our producer, he mm -hmm. took that picture for our first album, April Fools. Yeah. So we actually it did a duo thing, uh, and I don't think Eric usually does that, but that was like the duo, him and me, and we did three albums, but we only did one live gig for national radio. Okay. So it was, it was like we never toured anything. We just like got together. And we made April Fools, which was mostly uh, our own songs. We did about mm -hmm. half and half. Yeah. Uh, he wrote half, I wrote half. And then we did uh, one called River Road, where we actually wrote two or three songs together, which was nice. Mm -hmm. And the last one was Hello Stranger, where we mixed uh, sort of the black and, and the white um, areas of string man music and country blues and things and stuck them together. And uh, it, was, it was it was really nice, you know. I thought we had a really nice blend. I think the albums are actually very good, but they're out of print, and you know they're they're not around. All right. So this is uh, one of the really really yeah. Nice that's it. Of, yeah, that's it. Stomping with uh, Alvin Youngblood Hart and, and Brian and and uh, Mons Crawford, and uh, yeah, I met Brian through through. Um, I, wanting to buy an Amistar guitar and saw that he had one online and I contacted him and then I, I went to Stockholm and he had a couple and uh, there and I and I bought yeah. one and then we started hanging out and playing a bit yeah. and um, played at, at and you and I played at the Robert Johnson thing that Brian exactly. did remember that yeah. that was really nice so I really enjoyed that you know yeah, me too. and yeah. Brian is a kind and, of, uh, you know, yeah. Brian is a person who really loves to get gather people, and to do some he does. stuff. And uh, he's he's promoting blues yeah. so well. So I really. I mean, he's that. the one that really got the whole jam scene in in Sweden started. And yeah. I remember when he got the award a few years ago at Omo, and I was so happy for him because he really yeah. deserves it. He, oh, you know, he's yeah. done a lot. Yeah. Um, I live in the countryside, you know, I'm hardly ever in Stockholm, so I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to the jams. Uh, and I don't get that many gigs in Sweden. I, I tour around in other countries. I went to Australia a couple of times and, you know, around like that. It's but, like um, you're never a prophet in your own town or, or your own well, country or something. I, Brutzi, who, uh, who were, were promoting one of the records a couple of years ago, I talked to the guy, one of the guys there and said, like, you know, I don't get it kind of like I get great reviews and playing in a lot of different places major festivals but yeah. he, he said well he thought that like if um, well since you don't live in America and you live here people think you can't be so good because otherwise you'd live in America Oh, that's, that's <laughs> and that was far, further from the truth. That, I mean, it's, no, I think that well, I that's what I suggested might be the cause. And he said, unfortunately, Bert, I think that's that's the reason. So, mm. well, what are you gonna, you know, whatever. Anyway, I'm 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 not, I'm not angry about it or anything. I just would really love to play more in Sweden. Yeah. Um, but uh, Omo Blues and Christina Ahm Blues have uh, been really nice to me in, in Sweden. I played a lot at those yeah. festivals and they dig acoustic music. But you know yourself, man, acoustic yeah. music, it's really difficult. Acoustic yeah, blues, they all want like... And everything, yeah, sure. Yeah, 
they they want like guitar slingers and we're not guitar slingers you know not in that fashion you know no, i mean no. there's some great we're, there's some great guitar players around i i dig alvin youngblood i'm so cool yeah. to play with him oh about alvin yeah. i gotta ask you something because when i met him mm. and that was in 96 7 something like that he came to Colton yeah to play and then uh, okay uh, i was playing with sam mitchell at the time and we went to see him live Hmm. And he was like uh, very friendly, and then we went to Helsingborg and uh, just you know hung out for a couple of days. And Scott hmm. Beretta uh, invited us for a cocktail right, or something. Scott. So we were yeah, uh, at Scott's it's... place, and uh, we were just chatting. And, and, and Alvin told me like uh, we were talking about our uh, favorite musicians, how we listen to these old records. The, the, they're a more scratching sound than the real music that you can hear because of the age and everything. <laughs> And he yeah. said, well, we don't hear that scratch. I, we just hear music, right? Yeah, that's right. So, and he said, well, you know, when I listen to Blind Lemon Jefferson, it's like somebody shot me with a shotgun. And, uh, and mm-hmm. that was such a great comparison of, you know, listening to your favorite musicians. Who, who shot Bert Divert with a shotgun? Oh, the old master. Well, as Who's far as the favorite? blues, Sunhouse and Yank Rachel. I mean, I... When I was 16 years old, I used to watch public television, which like nobody watched ed- educational television in the, the U.S., you know, none of the kids anyway. But I used to turn it on and see what I could find. And one day I saw this thing. There was this old black guy sitting playing this resonator guitar, which I'd seen pictures of, but didn't know anything about. And I I'd read a little bit about some of the older blues guys through listening to English music, you know, yeah. but um He's playing these two songs, Preaching Blues and uh, Death Letter. And I just like, wow, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I said, I want to go to Mississippi, you know. But yeah. these were hard times in Mississippi, man. This is when all the really bad stuff was happening. Yeah. You know, the the demonstrators and, and the people trying to help people, you know, get votes and stuff. They were being murdered by the Ku Klux Klan and, and police and everything else. You know, I, I couldn't get, go down there. And then by the time I'd gotten older, um, well, I headed off to Sweden. But it, it was always a dream to go down there. But I listened to, to Sunhouse and, you know, and later Yank and, and that. Uh, and I, I, you know, I was playing blues I learned how I made my own bottleneck by taking breaking a bottle when yeah. I was sixteen and and rubbing it on this on stones and so it wouldn't be sharp and cut off my yeah. finger, you yeah, know. But Yank Rachel just knocked me out, you know, when we heard that record and and I finally found an album when I lived in Sweden and I yeah. decided, yeah, two thousand seven four or so four or five to get a good mandolin and to really learn how to play and i would shut it for two years drove my violin playing wife nuts she said you're playing it wrong i said i know the notes wrong but like i'm i'm trying to figure it out you know but i i can improvise and all that you know it's you know i and and i had a lot of help being a guitarist but man playing mandolin is totally different oh yeah you get you at least you can move your fingers, but everything else. But I'm used to playing a lot of different um, tunings. I play Dad Gad, I play Open G, uh, D, D minor, uh, C, all kinds of stuff, as, as you do too. And it helps keep your mind in different places. So I never get mixed up if I go from one tuning to the other. Yeah. Hey, why don't you give there us was me a with, with Bill Abel? And <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, we'll go back to that. Yeah. Uh, could you yeah. give us just a little hint of, of like a Yank Rachel style on the mandolin if you just play a couple of licks? That would be great. Yeah, I got a, um, a national uh, RM1 mandolin that I use. It's a resonator. And um, the reason is that I don't want to take the, <coughs> the vintage ones on the road because you never know what happens with them. And they're kind of funky. These are actually very easy to play and set up these, the modern ones, you know, yeah. but they're, they're, they're loud too, which is really yeah. good if you're playing on the streets. Uh, Yank did some really cool stuff. Um, and some of his licks, like he uses upstrokes, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> 
something like that. Yeah. I love these sort of dissonant things he does. Like he's playing a, a, in the key of C. Like in, and he plays something like this. He's hitting, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, yeah, I have to think. What is it? Got an A and a B flat at the same time. Sounds so dissonant, but it's so great. So I got into learning, like watching the few clips that were actually around of Yang playing, like Meow Man Blues with uh, Sleepy John. And then I got some clips from other people and started uh, hanging around in these uh, blues mandolin uh, areas where, you know, I found out there were like five people that had made albums. All right. And I got in touch with all, all the other four and traded albums with them. Jimmy Hawking in in, the, in um, Australia, and we ended up doing a tour together there. Uh, Rich Del Grosso in the US. Um, oh yeah, I know Rich, yeah, he's great. Uh, yeah. Uh, Billy Flynn in the US, um, who actually only made one album, but he does play live sometimes, and he's, he's played with a lot of the Chicago guys. Yeah. Uh, Jim Richter, um, who else? Uh, yeah, well, Rich Del Grosso, he's the he's the guy that's been around most doing, and he's a great guy. And he came over and toured yeah. with, with me too. Um, and uh, well, I finally did make it to Mississippi, and I met um, uh, Scott Beretta. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, man, I used to stay with Scott sometimes over in Oxford when he was living there. Um, he's a great guy, and um, uh, I I had been uh, talking to. Oh, who, to uh, Brian Kramer about this guy that used to play with Adam Gussow, who was living in Mississippi. And so I chatted with Adam Gussow um, online a bit, and he said I should go fi find Bill Abel when I went to Clarksdale. So I yeah. went to Clarksdale, and, I, and at the Muddy Waters Cabin uh, dedication, this was 2007, um, he was tuning Honey Boy Edwards' guitar. I went to see Honey Boy. And uh, I went up after this, uh, afterwards and said, uh, are you Bill Abel? Because Adam told me what he looked like and all that. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's me. And I said, hey, man. That's it. <laughs> um, I, I was talking to Adam about you. And uh, so we started jamming. And he said, hey, uh, why don't you come with me to uh, like the Juke tonight? Yeah, I, I was playing at the Juke Joint Festival. Yeah. So I said, cool. So I started played and jammed with him a bit and stayed around and then yeah we became friends and I I, I went back in 2008 and uh, I was working on uh, uh, some stuff with him and and uh, then in 2010 we did well we used to play with John and I went down to Italy and played with him and John uh, Cadillac John Nolden and, and yeah. then uh, we were playing with T-Model Ford a bit and um Oh, there's then a picture of the team model we as well. Some... Let's go over there. Yeah, yeah. That's right, Sam uh, Carr. Yeah. <laughs> there's team model. That's when we recorded uh, the Jack Daniel time. And one of, I don't know if it, that was his last album, but one of the last ones. Yeah. Um, and uh, Bill was recording it. And uh, I was sitting in the Volvo, his car, <laughs> mobile uh, thing, helping him out. And then sometimes I would, I would play session inside and he would be recording. And so we switched around and sam carr was on the 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 bill too and so uh, we asked sam to come over and be on my next record uh, which yeah. he kindly did um uh, unfortunately he died before it was released so he, he, ne he yeah. never got to hear it but he did a great job so i i got to meet a lot of yeah. people in clarkstown and people were nice and uh, i played at some good i played at the uh, king biscuit festival with bill and stan street uh, they joined me on my sets. Uh, yeah, Stan yeah. Street owns the Hambone Gallery in Clarksdale. And um, yeah, just great, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, now I have been playing with Libby Ray Watson. We got to know each other because she uh, she was Sam Chapman's protege. And Sam is one of my absolute top favorites, yeah. you know, one, uh, one guitar. Yeah. And uh, she came over and toured over here in uh, Sweden with me and uh, played in Olmo and then we made a record which got great reviews. We got booked at uh, a whole bunch of festivals in Mississippi and uh, 
we're gonna we were gonna play at the the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, and the pandemic came. Yeah. So it all got canceled. The next year it was going to happen, got canceled again. 2022, finally, May, it was going to happen, this May. Yeah. And I said, sorry, Louis, I just can't do this. You know, I'm yeah. like health wise, I'm kind of worried and, you know, COVID's still going. And yeah. uh, I'm, I've been wanting to meet um, Charlie Musselwhite because he's been on my Thai album that I made yeah. and also this this album with Lily Ray. And, yeah. and she said that, that actually Charlie got COVID there. A lot of people got COVID. It was a super spreader event. So it's yeah. probably just as well I didn't go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell us so. about these photos uh, here. So who yeah. are the people on the photos? We came okay. this deep. Yeah. Well, the one before it was uh, Cadillac John Nolden, who's a yeah. wonderful guy from... Um, He's from Sunflower, I believe, uh, originally, yeah. uh, in Mississippi. And um, that's Peter Case uh, yeah. and me in 1973. Um, and I went over in December 2019. Peter played my way to come over, and we hadn't seen each other in like, I don't know, 48 years or something. <laughs> and uh, I came really? I came over there, and I played on his, his album, The Midnight Broadcast. It was really cool. Yeah. I had a great time. Um, that's my longtime friend Tom Paley. We met in yeah. 1980 or 81 at the uh, Vauxholm's Wies Festival, yeah. and uh, playing. We were both playing, and that's one of our neighbors um, playing the fiddle there. And yeah. he and I started playing together, and he came and visited and stayed with us every year and until about 2010. And in 2011, yeah. we went over to visit him. He yeah. he became so ill with cancer and things, he couldn't travel much, unfortunately. No. Great musician and great person. Yeah. All right. And this is Memphis Gold from Washington, D.C. area. A real fun guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, and he was over in Omo playing, and I've been over visiting him and staying at his house over in Washington. Great. Sam Carr, the Delta drummer, man, the son yeah. of Robert Nighthawk. He played with Houston Stackhouse. He played with Robert. He played with Buddy Guy. He played with this all these cats up in like Chicago. Whoa, yeah. He's like the Delta drummer. Even on his wall at home, I drove him home after the session. They said he had a letter from the governor saying he was his favorite drummer. You know, it was, it was incredible, <laughs> and just such a sweet, kind guy and great stories. Yeah. And just like yeah, yeah. And then, but the funny thing was, we played we played uh, Special Agent, the Sleepy John Estes and uh, Yank yeah. Rachel tune, and and it's real country blues, you know. And he goes, hey. Y'all playing country. <laughs> when are y'all going to play some blues? Because he's the shuffle master, you know? Yeah. So then we, we played a shuffle tune for him. But, like, I asked him, "Have you? did you ever hear Sleepy John and Yank, you know? Because he lived close to Helena, Arkansas, yeah. just over the, over the line, you know, in, in Como. And, and, like, no, he never heard them. But he li used to listen to country music on the radio, he said. Yeah. You know, which was pretty common. <laughs> a lot of people there. Yeah. I mean, he listened to what was on, right? Yeah. yeah, of course. <laughs> Great guy. Great guy. I'm so, yeah. I was so happy he was on an album. He was really yeah. kind. This you is a, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's sipping Jack, Dan yeah. Jack oh, Daniels. No, no, no. That was juice. That was juice uh, or tea. <laughs> they, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, one night, Eric had a gig in Crosstown or something, and then he dropped by afterwards and uh, yeah. played my. Uh, do a duoly in there, and I had a Sobel guitar at the time, yeah. just hanging out in my house in the country. But like yeah. I said, he was in Stockholm, I was in Karlstad, man, you know, and and I was actually getting paid. So I mean, I bought a house and was living on it, you know. And Eric was yeah. struggling, you know, with all this, the way it was in Stockholm, and he couldn't get paid at all. Yeah, so but he made it uh, in the end. He was uh, well, you know, was, he left you. the country and went to England, and then when he got reimported, then. He made it, exactly. you know? yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, he was always great. You know, great guitar player, great charisma uh, yeah, on yeah. stage, and wonderful yeah. voice. I love his arrangements on guitar. He plays it like nobody yeah, else. Yeah, does some. Uh, yeah, he does some yeah. great stuff. Yeah. Great. All right. Uh, this is me and my buddy to, Pong. Yeah, we yeah. have to finish off with with this uh, Thailand uh, adventure of yours. That's an amazing story. Well, I, I. I went to Thailand in, in uh, 2005 to visit a friend there, and I heard that there was a blues bar called Adhere 13th down um, in Bangkok. And so I was trying to find the place. I, and the last night I was in Bangkok, I found it, and I, I went in, and 
or the next to last night. And th this guy Pong was playing guitar with his band and they were so good. And he came out and was having a smoke and I had a chat with him and said, I play blues mandolin. He said, oh, well, can he come and jam with us? I said, yeah, you know, I mean, nobody asks you to jam in Sweden ever, you know, unless you go to Brian's jam, but otherwise it just doesn't never happens, you know. Yeah. So I'm I'm used to the jam kind of thing in the US and all. So I said, yeah, so I came with the mandolin and he really dug it. And so we, we kept in touch. And in 2009, Yana Sander, who I play with, I've been playing with since 1985, he and I were booked at the, the um, uh, Phuket Blues Festival. And we went there, we played, and then we went up to Bangkok and started jamming every night with the band there that he had, Pong had. And then Yana went home and I stayed on for several weeks and they asked me to be on their album. So I played blues, blues mandolin on their album. And then they said, you want to come on a tour with us? I said, yeah. So I came back <laughs> about six months later and went on tour with them and met all these other great Thai musicians, including the, the guy, two guys, three guys from the caravan band, Katarwan, they're called, which is the, like the, they're superstars. They were real, well, Surachai, the sort of main singer and, and guitar player, he was yeah. considered the Bob Dylan of Thailand, but I mean, they, he was chased by the military. They were going to kill these guys. So they, <laughs> they were real protest singers. They wrote songs criticizing the government, but poetic. And finally, they got amnesty after living in the jungle for like six years. They came out and they just hit it big. And they've been playing ever since. They've toured all over the world. And uh, now Sergei is playing on his own. Most of the, unfortunately, most of the other guys are, uh, have passed away. But uh, I got to play with, with Sergei and Monkon. And Sergei is on our album, the same album that Charlie Musselwhite is on. It's just amazing. <laughs> right. And I'm still playing there. So I go there. I, I've been there 12 or 13 times playing, you know, and right. I made an album and Pong and I won two songwriting awards, the best instrumental in Thailand, 2009 and 2012. That's so, great. Congratulations. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So how yeah. about the next coming event? Let's finish off with talking a little bit about Omo Blues Festival, because you're going to be playing there. I'm going to be playing there. And I see some uh, time slots when... Uh, you have the time to visit me when I'm playing, so you're more than welcome to join me. I hope, uh, I hope I can. I'm gonna be, uh, the the first gig I have is on Thursday in the afternoon with uh, with the uh, Yana Sander. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, uh, and after that, I have a couple. I have those street gigs, you know. Yeah. And sort of me too. Tied up there, Friday, but I'm gonna. Uh, I want between twelve and two. Yeah. Yeah, and then on Saturday uh, between two and four. So I'm going to try to hook up with Svante uh, on yeah. on Saturday and I'll try to hook up with you some other time or whatever. We'll figure yeah. something out. But we'll I mean, figure, I, yeah, no I really enjoyed it. The last time when we played in that little cafe, yeah. you know, you were doing a gig there and, uh, or just anywhere. I mean, sit outside and play. It's, if it's nice <laughs> weather, it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at the weather forecast and it's going to be sunny, just a little bit cloudy. Uh, okay. Uh, all through the festival, so it's going to be great because it's really. I'll have my Panama hat. Yeah. I'll be ready. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you, Bert, and thanks so much for coming. And, Thank uh, you. Thank you, Mac. All right. Then I'll I'll, I'll see right. you in Omo, and I uh, wish you all the best. We'll do. I'm all trying right. to see where I'm in the picture. Yeah, there I am. Yeah. Um, right. We'll see you in Omo, and uh, I look forward to uh, trading licks and trading more stories. Okay? I want to hear all your right. side of the stories. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody, for listening. All right. So, everybody, um, say bye-bye, and thanks to Bert Divert, and uh, I'll continue with my theme for today. I think you all understand that uh, Bert and I could talk for ages about everything. He's such a great guy. So um, today's theme was uh, how to how to practice songs that you already know. And uh, it's not going to be a long rant. It's just this uh, thing that I just uh, did in the beginning when I usually play the welcome song. And up until now, I kind of went through 
the song that I may be planning to play and uh, just uh, made, made sure that the grooves there and everything was fine. But today I didn't want to think about it. I just threw myself into it and decided uh, like a minute before I should go on what to play. And, and that resulted in, in, in not such a good performance, which I gladly, I'm giving it to you guys, you know, no problem. And of course it never needs to be totally perfect, but um, that really wasn't good. So the thing is, when, when you think about uh, how to maintain your good shape as a musician, and th that doesn't have to mean that you're a professional. It can be on all our uh, stages. I don't call them levels because I don't like to divide uh, in that way. It's not the level that, you know, this beginner, intermediate, advanced, masters, whoever. But uh, it's like, okay, what, what's, what's the best I can do within what I'm doing best and how can I maintain that? I have a little story about Rick Story, pun intended, because his surname is Story, S-T-O-R-E-Y. Uh, he, he's a friend of mine, and we used to play together in the 90s in Sweden. He, he played banjo. And I've never seen and never met more consistent musician than Rick was. Because no matter if he had gigs or not, every morning... Every day, as soon as he got up, had some breakfast, some coffee, he would pick up his banjo and play for at least an hour and a half, sometimes two, sometimes more, if he was preparing for the tour or something else. And he went through the whole program from the first to the last song of those songs that they usually played with his band or um, in different constellations and uh, combinations of people he played with. So he was very consistent in doing this every single day, which meant that actually he, he worked as classical musicians do. They, they practice between two and four, sometimes five, six hours a day uh, to be able to play on the highest possible level in orchestras as, as soloists or whatever. And he, he kind of obviously invested a lot of time in his well-being on stage because if you're really well rehearsed if you really know your chops and you you have them all here in the drawers that are really close behind then it's easy to do uh, we can't get away by saying like well we play blues it's like a it's a simple music form and uh, you know we know the turnarounds we know the uh the chorus when we change chords and all that so within that whatever you do is fine it's okay no 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 no. Uh, there 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 needs to be a groove there needs to be dynamics there needs to be lots of stuff that we can we can talk about uh, I'm gonna be showing you a couple of licks just as a little example of, of what I mean with that but it's like if what's the best choice should we uh, practice mechanically, just like the way we always play the song and just repeat that two, three times and then go to next song, two, three times, then go to next song and so on and so on. Is that a good way? Or should it be like, okay, I'll play this song, let's see what I can do with it a bit different. Can I play this faster, slower? Should I change the tuning? Should I change the key? Uh, how can I make this a bit more exciting? I've played a song, let's say, for maybe 20, 25 years the same way. And then, yeah, well, this is mostly for us who play old blues songs. And uh, in, in my, let's say, program, I have stuff that's kind of, you know, hillbilly, early country music, blues, a bit of ragtime, uh, shuffles, Chicago blues, a lot of Muddy Waters influence stuff, and then all other kinds of songs that come in through my collaborations with other musicians where I need to either back them up or we do some things together. So my, my, my approach is always uh, that I like playing uh, the, the frame of a song the same way and usually the introduction I do very uh, similar or the same each time I play a certain song. There are a couple of reasons. First, 
uh, I made them myself, so to say. And uh, I like those intros. I uh, set myself into a right and good groove and good feeling before I start singing about something. And then uh, I kind of set the, the level of everything that I want to play it on. And uh, from that moment on, there can be this kind of blues, the frame of the blues when you, you know your chord changes and all that, but then in between you can really improvise. So that's the great thing about blues. If, if I was playing as a touring musician, uh, backing up, uh, you know, uh, some, some singers or playing in bands where you have arrangements that you have to play the same all the time, that's another thing. But let me, let me just give you a little example of this stuff. So, uh, when I, when I, uh, when I play, let's say, if I play uh, uh, Kansas City Blues, I always have this kind of signature uh, introduction that I always play, and that's something like this. Walking down Main Street, and so on, going down because I always start by playing this. Uh, if I play... Uh, song by Little Walter called You Better Watch Yourself. I always start by kind of getting, uh, paying a tribute to Little Walter and the band and the original recording from I think mid 50s uh, where you have this, uh, this is how the intro goes. You better watch yourself. And then you go with that shuffle, right? Uh, and then I've got this intro when I play uh, I'm Ready with, by Willa Dixon that goes like... So let's say these songs, I always play the same way. Uh, another song in E, as I'm already here, let's say, uh, Sitting on Top of the World. let's say the songs that I would uh, basically always play the same way and when I practice them I just make sure that these parts are uh, really really down to where I want them and now when I'm practicing uh, for the Omo Blues Festival I'm going through my sets planning the way I maybe thought about okay how should I do this how should I do that and then I always set the intros and then I also think about solos, because some solos are, uh, of course, not the best ones in the world, but I kind of enjoy playing certain notes at certain uh, parts of a song. And uh, I usually go through, uh, let's say, okay, how, how would I want to play the solo on this one? Of course, there'll be place for improvisation, because you do the blues turnaround a couple of times, so maybe you don't have to play the solo just once in one uh, chorus, maybe you can play two choruses, then go back to singing or something. So uh, I would definitely go through that because some, uh, maybe some signature licks are there when it comes to, to solos. Signature licks that can be either mine or uh, paying tribute to old masters. Uh, I remember this lick. Uh, 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 that's right, that's... Uh, uh, Robert Junior Lockwood, when he played his shuffles, uh, then he used to uh, play something similar to. And so on. Right, so, so I'll, I'll make sure that that's, you know, uh, where I need it to be. When it comes to dynamics, uh, that's also something that I, I usually kind of go through a little bit. When I'm going to take it down a little bit, when I'm going to push it forward. 
and then also assembling songs together to make sure that I don't play two songs in the same groove right after each other and all that. But that comes into creating set lists. And I told you about that in the two weeks ago in the live stream when we talked about uh, making set lists for festivals or, or, or club gigs. So uh, uh, a new arrangement, that's also something that I sometimes do when I, when I have a good feeling when it's a you know, great audience, you're feeling inspired, and sometimes you can let go of the kind of um, well-prepared everything that you can just kind of uh, improvise a bit more. And that would make maybe be a, let's say, a, uh, which song would that be? Uh, oh, that's right. We'll go into the lick of the week directly because that's an open D. And that's also something that I'm going to be kind of uh, throwing myself into as a kind of improvisation because I haven't done it before that way. So it's like, okay, which song could I do there? And uh, here comes the lick of the week that I will go through right away. And it's in open D. Right? So... Uh, Here's your relic of the week. It's not going to be something, let's say, or uh, let's say usual stuff, which when you say lick or melody, you usually think well, treble strings uh, or something in between, but not basses. So today's lick of the week is going to be the one played on the basses. So I'm going to be picking my three bass strings, the sixth, fifth, and the fourth, and what slide is going to do is this. If you think that it's, uh, this is reminding of, of Ry Cooter, Yes, it is, because he, he uh, he's the master of these kinds of grooves and all that. But I think, like, let's think a little bit to incorporate the slide, even when playing bass strings. So, very slowly. Four. So we do the fourth chord either here or with the with the slide on the fifth fret. So all notes that we have here. And then so as many play as many notes you can to play with the, with the slide would be great. So the first, obviously, we can't, but uh, the rest of them. Then you got this great lick here. This, uh, th this afternoon, I said, yeah, cool. And I was preparing for, for the Olmo Festival, and I thought, wow, this could be cool. And uh, I thought, okay, I'm, what's the song I could play with this lick? And I came, okay, let's pay the homage to Ry Cooter and the guys of that time in the late 70s, 80s, crazy about an automobile, right? So I'll, 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 I'll try to put all those together. And that's going to be a challenge for the festival because I haven't done it before and uh
stuff in between. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. All right. So basically, that's all I had for you guys uh, for this evening. And uh, I'm only eight minutes past the hour, so it's it's cool. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Oh, Bert went to the uh, viewer loge. <laughs> loge. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you, Bert. And we have uh, Marta saying thank you to Bert as well as uh, Jonas. David Hunt, my piano playing brother. And then uh, we also have something that Milan said. The lick can open D's go, yeah, great. Oh man, I wish we could play that together sometime. Maybe we can make it happen. That's great. But um, so basically, thanks so much for coming today. And I will see you guys next week. And when it comes to uh, live streams in late July and August, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that Monday in the beginning of August because I'll be in the UK at the Blues Week. But who knows? Maybe I'll send uh, from my mobile phone while jamming with my Blues buddies over there. We'll see what we do. But anyway, let's uh, listen to the Bye Bye song, Sitting on Top of the World, with uh, Sam Mitchell and me from uh, our CD, Too Long From Home. Actually, today, Bert and I were two guys long from home as well. So thank you, Bert, again for coming along today, and uh, thank you, everybody, for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Don't you shake my tree Get out of my orchard Let my feet just be Now she's gone I don't worry But I'm sitting on top of the world
But I'm sitting on top of the world Now she's gone And I don't worry But I'm sitting on top Now she's gone 